thank you um, so much for bringing us all together, Lord, and just unity, Father, in, in, in uh, harmony as well, Lord, just coming together to uh, with one goal, Lord, and that's simply to look more into you and into your word and into who you are, and uh, Lord, to be instructed in the way that we should go, Father, in this life that you've given us, you created us uh, for a reason, for a purpose, Lord, and we pray, uh, Lord, that we would honor you, glorify you, choose you in our day-to-day -day, uh, mundane, everything that we go through in life, that we would just look to you, and uh, be pleasing, Father, in your sight. We know that we all fall short of your glory and that we cannot be perfect in and of ourselves, Lord. We just pray that you would remind us uh, that it's all about your spirit, Lord. It's all about who you are and what you can do in and through our lives that makes uh, us look like anything, but really the true power is you within us. And so uh, do a work, work with us, Lord. Continue doing that work, especially even now as we get in your word. We pray that if there's anything false, if there's anything uh, that needs to be corrected, uh, that, that you would uh, guide us into all truth, Lord. That you would help us to consider your word above man's word and uh, continue to uh, just pressing press in, Father, to all that you have. And I pray if there's anybody here or anybody who will listen to this teaching, Father, that they uh, would come to your salvation, Father. That they will come to your goodness to recognize uh, who you are and lay down their pride and uh, give up their life, Lord, commit suicide <laughs> and, and truly just uh, live for you, Lord, that they would experience that abundant life that comes through you. And so uh, we love you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 2 Thessalonians, you guys remember chapter 1 dealing with what? The birth of the church, right? It's talking about when the church started and, you know, there in Thessalonica, Paul He's on his missionary journeys, and he's got a mission, right? What is his mission? Is simply to give the gospel, simply to teach the word to those who respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he would he just teaches them, admonishes them, continues to get their attention, their focus, to look at the word of God instead of the regular traditional lifestyles that they've lived, and now live the life that God's called them to live. And, and so it really involved God. It involved faith toward God, and God is the one, obviously, who starts any fellowship, right? He's the one who started the church, and he continues to start the church, right, throughout this entire world. So their faith toward God, it really revolved and involved God himself, and, and really the gospel of God. So we saw that in the hearing of the gospel, we saw that in the receiving of the gospel, and also in the results of the gospel. And, and this is very natural, it's very progressive, right? And, and it really, it's a, it's a progressive thing in any believer. If you, once you heard the word of God, you received the word of God. In other words, you responded to it, right? John 3, 16, John 3, talking about you want to be born again. Uh, it's about believing in Jesus, right? So those who chose to believe in the Lord, lay down their pride, lay down their life. In Mark chapter uh, 8, talking about, hey, picking up your cross and following him, right? It's about just giving up. And, and that's what Paul's been going through right here. Hey, this is the birth of the church, in, in other words, right? Talking about it. And so first you hear the word, you receive the word, and, and there should be results from receiving the word, right? And that result is not going to be you, anything that you're attempting or trying at or building anything for God, any kind of empire or anything, right? Right? It's all about now watching and waiting and seeing the Lord in and through your life, right? And that's the, we call it, it's our Christianese, the fruit, right? It's the fruit of the Spirit that's being produced. And like James, that when he was teaching before, he's like, nobody ever just stops and just like, oh, and then bloop, 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 and like fruit, you know, on a tree. The tree doesn't have to like try, it just naturally produces. So it's the same thing for all of us. So chapter two, it's gonna, it's going from the birth of the church and now it's going to go more so towards the growth of the church, right? We're going to start to see that progression now in chapter 2. And we're not talking about uh, numbers here. You know, today we watch TV and these pastor, teacher, people, false people uh, on TV, they'll, they're, they're all about numbers, right? How many people we can get in the church? Wow, that, that shows the, the success of the church, right? That means God is moving in their church because there's so much numbers in the church. 
And, and really, that's the idea of a lot of us today, and that's sad. Mm. And n numbers was never the idea in the word. Yes, go and tell the gospel to all the world, but it never said anything about um, having big churches and all of that. In fact, in Acts, here in Thessalonica, there are small little house churches, house fellowships uh, throughout, and then they're, they're broken up all over the place. Bless you. Um, so... We're not talking about numbers here, right? We're talking about spiritual growth uh, before we go through everything. So in case you guys get all confused, you're like, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so we're going to see that, that the spiritual growth of the Thessalon the Thessalonians, right? <laughs> it, it, it really uh, res results from the Word of God. It came as a result of really Paul teaching, right? And, and he's caring for them. And he's simply just loving on them. He's being there. And, and his heart is not for anything of himself. Nothing to gain back, but everything to give. And that should be our attitude in ministry, is to, to give, 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 and don't want anything in return. Why? Because Jesus is the one who satisfied you. And because of that, you're overflowing. And because you're overflowing, you just want to keep giving what, what God keeps giving you. And when you guys get in the Word, I get, I'm pretty sure you guys understand, you get in the Word in the morning or whenever you get in the Word, and you're so excited, right? God just, you just, your whole day goes amazing, and you're so excited, you just want to share with others, and that's a good thing. I think we should do that. Um, so Paul's ministry to the church of Thessalonica, it was incredibly powerful, and it's a great example of how we should be uh, in ministry as well, as far as teaching and caring for and just loving on others. It's a good thing. So let's just read... Um, the word. It says in verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, or at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error, or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but of but God, who test our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from uh, others. When we this is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, remember from chapter 1. We might have made demands as apostles of Christ, uh, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God, and you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly uh, and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you, into his own kingdom and glory. Well, explains it all. I don't think you guys need me to say anything here, but let's just go over it again. Go back to verse uh, 1, and in and, and these verses we're going to look at Paul's ministry really to the church, right? Notice the growth of the church. It really involved Paul's ministry to this church here in Thessalonica. So there's really three things uh, to note today, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if we'll get to the third thing necessarily, but uh, about Paul's ministry that becomes very, very important to us to understand today as a church. The the first is really the message of Paul's ministry. And then the message of Paul's ministry is in verses one and two, and obviously we're going to see uh, that his message uh, of Paul's ministry it was true. It wasn't false. Obviously, we wouldn't be here today if it was, right? It would be proven, you know, guilty, and be like, ah, there it is. But obviously it was true. And secondly, we're going to look at the motive of Paul's ministry in verses 3 and 4. And the motive of Paul's ministry was pure. Okay? And, and then we're going to see the manner of Paul's ministry. And that's going to be in verses 5 
through 12. Actually, I don't think we'll get to verse 12, but we'll see. Uh, and the manner of Paul's ministry, it was just simply right, okay? And, and so let's just start in the first one. The message of Paul's ministry, and this is going to be in verses 1 and 2. Look at verse 1 again. It says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before we were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So we saw that last time we were together that his message uh, really involved Jesus Christ, right? And, and why he's even talking to them. And it was not his own views. It wasn't his own opinions, right? It, it, when, we, when he came to the church of Thessalonica with really the, his message, it involved and revolved around the person of Jesus Christ. He wasn't... Uh, crazy about anybody else or anything else, right? It was simply, he was just in love and crazy about Jesus. And that's how we should be today, right? We shouldn't be so excited about, oh, let me tell you about uh, this going on in the world right now, this government, and this and this, and oh, aliens, and this. Right? <laughs> uh, what about Jesus? Oh, he's cool too. But anyways, right? We should have more excitement when it comes to Jesus Christ. And let everything else be everything else, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but let Jesus be everything. So we saw back in Romans 1.16 that Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So obviously there is power in the message that Paul is bringing to the church of Thessalonica, and this power is able to convert the hardest heart, right? The person who's like all caught up in their own tradition, in their own world, in their own religion. It's, it's able to get them from everything that they've ever known. And I think all of you guys would agree, right? Some of you guys grew up in the, you know, in a Catholic church, right, all your life, mm -hmm. or grew up in, you know, different lifestyles, and all of a sudden you came to the Word of God, you heard the gospel, and what happened? The gospel converted you from the ways of man to just the person of Jesus Christ alone in His Word, right? And not necessarily to a specific church or a fellowship, but you came to Jesus, and that's all that matters. And, and, and everything else is everything else. But I've learned two things about the message that Paul brings to the church of Thessalonica in verses 1 and 2. Notice in verse 1, this message, it was not in vain. Notice that again. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Paul's message in coming to the church of Thessalonica was not in emptiness. It was not at worthlessness. It was not vanity. Right? It was full of worth. It was jam-packed, right? There was an abundance of worth, I guess you could say, in this message. Uh, but wait a minute, you might ask. Didn't didn't they run Paul out of town? You know, don't, don't didn't they chase him, you know, down the road there? Uh, yes, they did, right? But you you see the coming of the, the to Thessalonica with the message of the gospel, he he when he brought it, it wasn't vanity. It was for a purpose. It was for a reason. And it, that reason and purpose was not for Paul. It was for Jesus. He put his life on the line for Jesus. And I, I, I would encourage all of you guys to pray and ask the Lord, hey, would you, you know, would you want me to be anywhere else than here in Tucson, right? What if God said, hey, go to Iran right now, go to Afghanistan right now, go to, right, all the, yeah, go to Africa, go to anywhere, go to these places, yeah, bye-bye, <laughs> go, go, what if he did, what if God called you to a specific place and you knew that that was where the Lord wanted you to be for a specific time until he told you to get out of there again, you know, are you willing to go, and, and Paul did, he went with this message, and, and why? Because this message had power to save people. This message was able to save people. And, and a church was birthed, right? And now they beginning to grow. They're beginning to grow. They're beginning to mature. <laughs> so I, I fear oftentimes, though, we, we get discouraged in our own lives. And, and, and this is interesting, right? In dealing with family... <laughs> <laughs> neighbors, friends, we feel that somehow coming to them 
And, uh, you know, with this message of the gospel that we want to present to them, that maybe it's an emptiness, maybe it's in vain, maybe it's, you know, what's the purpose of giving the gospel? They don't listen to it, you know? And we feel like, man, why did I even go there? Why did I even give them the message? Why did I even bother, right? They're not listening, they don't care, they just run me out of town, they just chase me down the road, right? <laughs> kind of like Paul right here, what's happening? And here's a question for all of you guys. Have you guys ever felt that, that way before in dealing with people, you know, who are closest to you and you're trying to you're trying to give them the message of the gospel and it just feels like it isn't doing anything. Lord, why do I even try? Why is it me? Blah blah blah. I remember um, I remember being called to, to Ireland, believe it or not, the second time, right? I've been there before and, and here I am just kicking back with some friends. I think it was the Super Bowl that was on and we're all just you know, we're all just hanging out. And I told all, everybody, I was like, hey guys, I, I literally I muted the TV. I was like, we got to pray right now. Um, I was like, there's just, my heart, it was literally, it was pounding. And I was like, I was anxious. I was like, man, what's going on? And I was like, guys, just pray for me right now. Um, I know that the church, you know, that I was attending, they already went to Ireland. And, and I was never, you know, like, I was never part of that team. Because they, you know, for months they were building each other up and working with each other. I didn't even know who they, a lot of them, who they were. And, uh, and the Lord placed it on my heart, and I was like, guys, we got to pray. Uh, man, I, I just, I, I feel like i, I got to be in Ireland. <laughs> and, and what do you know? Amen, Lord. Thank you very much. Amen. We know we all pray. And they're like, okay, get on with it. You know, get out of the way of the TV. <laughs> and, then, and then we get a phone call, right? My, my friend gets the phone call, and, and they're all, hey, is Josh there? And he's like, yeah, he's right here. And it was the pastor in Ireland. And he's like, hey, Josh, uh, a lot of people are asking for you here, and we want to, we were wondering if you can come to the airport right now and come to Ireland. Can you drop everything and go? And I was all, wow. weird. <laughs> Whoa, does that happen? Like, seriously? That's, what is it? And everybody in the room now, now they're like, okay, he's not crazy. This is, this is, this is crazy. You know, like, what is, and it was an awesome, like, example to everybody there too how cool God is so um, God got me there though and I'm giving the gospel to people right I'm getting people's names hanging out with them talking to them and, and then uh, it's like day after the first day day two right I'm thinking in the morning like why should I even get up so early you know I'm done with the word why should I even go out there like Lord why am I even here they're not even listening mm -hmm. like am I just gonna come to be like really loud person in people's faces and then and then I'm gone and what impact did that do and the Lord showed me it's not about you I didn't want you I, I could care less if you're here or not all I want is the gospel to go out and are you willing to, to carry my message for me are you willing to proclaim the, the message of the gospel because that's where the power is that's gonna affect people's lives and, and what do you know? The doorbell rings and they all came to our little apartment that morning and they're, they're like, hey, tell us more about Jesus. And I was all, this is crazy. <laughs> well, the moment you think that it's for nothing, it's, it's so cool that God works behind the scenes. You never know what God is doing. So don't ever think you got God figured out in the lives of other people, yeah. right? Never judge in that sense. And just, just, just let the Lord have his way, right? And that's kind of Paul's idea here. He's going in there, he's proclaiming not his message, he's proclaiming the gospel's message, right? That he was called to. And so, um, pretty awesome. So friends, let me tell you guys something. Our message of Jesus Christ is not in vain, right? It's not in vain at all. It's life, it's eternal life, really. Think about it. It brings a lasting relationship. And we need to understand something that our obligation, our <coughs> glorious privilege is like that of Paul and Apollos. You guys remember those guys, right? Mm. Uh, some, of, some of us are used by God in planting the seed, and some of us are used by God in watering the seed, right? And, and, and that it's already planted. But ultimately, obviously, God is the one who gives the increase. And if you know anything about plants, there's got to be sunlight, right? Some kind of light that, you know, that grows so you can only do so much that God wants you to do in that process of coming together as a church. But the increase, everything else comes from the Lord himself. He is the water, right? He's the light. He's the, you know, you can give all those examples. 
So don't get frustrated, don't get discouraged, don't think that somehow, you know, you sharing the gospel, remember that's the point too, it's you sharing the gospel, it's not about you sharing you, so don't get all like offended about you and they didn't accept me or me, ma, and God's like slapping you. Was it about you going feeling good about yourself afterward or is it about you going giving the gospel and just let it be and let me have it? Oh, okay, <laughs> right? No, it's not about rebuilding yourself up. So it's not in vain, right, in what we do. So secondly, let's look at the message. It was in boldness. This message was in boldness. Look at verse 2 again. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold, and there it is, in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So was, was Paul spitefully treated there in Philippi? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, he was. And you can recall back in uh, ooh, Acts 16. Remember, he's, man, he's, he's beaten, he's thrown in prison, he's, he's, he's messed up, man. He's, there's all kinds of stuff that happens to him. He's thrown in the dungeon, he's thrown in the stocks, right? He's, he's just, man, he's, he's got it. So was he mis mistreated here in the church of Thessalonica? Yes, he was. Read Acts chapter 17. Um, in fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, um, which I don't have on there, it basically he says was with much conflict, right? But in verse 2 that we just read, at the end of verse 2, it says, We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. So let's face it, everyone uh, that saw Paul go anywhere, they saw that there was conflict. Even Paul himself saw that, right? He knew it was coming. He knew every, everywhere he's going to go, there's going to be opposition and trials. So understand that this was not, it wasn't a shocker to Paul. It wasn't something new like, oh, I'm going to get persecuted for Jesus? <laughs> mm. The moment of salvation, Acts chapter 9, you guys can read it on your own. But God even let him know that's going to be his gift. That's going to be his ministry. He's gonna, there's gonna, there has to be many things that are going to happen to him in his life. Um, and in Acts chapter 20, you guys remember when Paul was ministering there to, uh, in Miletus, to the elders? He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, he says, Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that, uh, that chains and tribulations await me. So there it is. Right? If, you want, if you want to read more about Paul, too, and all the stuff that he is going through, uh, you can read. Actually, let's read right now. 2 Corinthians, if, you don't, if you're a quick turner. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, and it's in verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse 23. I'll just I'll read it if, you, if you're not there. Uh, but this is Paul here, and this is some of the sufferings that Paul was going to go through, and he did go through that we can look back at. And so if you guys are ever like, Paul, don't try to minister to me. You don't know what I've been through. He's like, huh, you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> And these are some of the stuff that he would probably say. Uh, in verse 23 of 2 Corinthians 11, he says, Are they Hebrews? Well, actually, look verse 23. Are they ministers of uh, Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths, death, deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in per perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleepiness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides... The other things, what come up, comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. Isn't that cool? I just wanted you guys to listen. Just <clears throat> all that stuff that went on in Paul's life. What was his deep concern throughout all of it? The whole time, slashing him on the back. Ah! Oh! What's going on in his mind? The deep concern for the church. Ain't that insane? Wow. Don't you guys wish you guys had friends like that? <laughs> no matter what they're going through, they're thinking of you as you right, the body of Christ. It's amazing, and and how the Lord, you know, what's what's God doing in your life? It's pretty awesome. So, um, 
Also, Paul, Paul gives detail, right, about all these conflicts, all these tribulations and these troubles and these times that he, he's gone through. And yet with all that, he told us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 that we just read, that he was bold in speaking the word of God. He was still bold. Man could not quiet him down. The enemy could not come in and quiet him down. Something had happened to him dramatically that if it was a lie... And if it was made up, you like, I'm going to, you know, follow the Christians, you know, this is, I'm going to be a churchianity kind of a person. All of this stuff, he would have said, no way, I'm not going to follow Jesus for a lie. I'm not going to follow him if I made this all up, right? But look at all this stuff that he went through. Obviously, there is something there. So Paul had boldness in speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. And note carefully in verse 2 at the end how he was bold. Don't miss this, everybody. We were bold in who? In our God. Did you guys catch that? So how are you and I bold in the message that we proclaim? It is certainly not in our own strength. It's not in our own goodness. It's not in who we are, right? Or our own effort. But it's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, right, within our life. So turn with me to Acts chapter 4, if you don't mind. Acts chapter 4. And Peter and John... They're arrested for really proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And they stood there before the Sanhedrin, the 71 uh, members of the, the ruling body of uh, Judaism. And, and uh, so the religious leaders in Acts chapter 4, they saw that Peter and John, that they were, they were unskilled men, right? They were untrained men. And, but they saw the boldness of these two guys, and they perceived, hey, obviously there's some kind of power because they weren't trained in, you know, schooling. They, these guys obviously were with Jesus. There's some kind of power, authority behind the words that they speak. There's something that has happened here. And, of course, they said uh, when, when they, they forbid them not to speak the name of Jesus Christ, they, they say what to, to them? They say, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So, uh, obviously, they're like, no way. We, you know, obviously, God came in. He changed our lives. And, and Peter and John, they go back to the house uh, where the disciples are. And what do they begin to do? They begin to pray immediately. And they're praying and they're seeking the Lord. And look at verse 31 right here. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, friends, the one thing that you and I need is boldness to speak forth the gospel of Jesus Christ, right, in our lives. So let's face it, we get timid in, in, in proclaiming the gospel message, don't we? Around people, sometimes, you know, in the ministry that we have. And by the way, all of us have ministry, ministry that we're in. All of you are in a ministry if you're a believer, and all of you can minister in that right moms dads employees employers right friends family relatives there's always somebody that you can minister to in one form or another so i fear that we often get shy in giving the gospel of jesus christ to others right what are what are we lacking at that time when you're really really shy and you just don't want to speak anything according to this verse if you look at it notice in acts chapter 4 verse 31 they were filled with the holy spirit and they spoke the word of god with boldness and we need the filling of the holy spirit in our lives to speak forth with boldness how how what's the opposite of boldness shyness right what what, what what happened here in the bible so obviously it's biblical when the holy spirit comes upon you you're filled with that boldness to speak forth his word so it's the same thing that jesus said back in acts chapter 1 uh, verse 8 he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to, to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that is the overflowing of the Holy Spirit within us. It's not uh, for salvation, but of uh, power and strength that comes from God, right? In proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. It's when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. So let's look at the second thing. Um, and here's really the motive of Paul's ministry. And I don't think we're going to get to verse 12, actually. We're going, to, we're going to stop a little early. But the motive of Paul's ministry, it's pure. Look at verse 3. Uh, go back with me to 2 Thessalonians. 
first Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Who's that? Don't, don't go to second. Okay, look at, look at verse 3. It says, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Notice in verse 4, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So we see that by way of contrast, by the way, Paul's motive uh, to the church of Thessalonica in his ministry. First, Paul's list, uh, he lists the negatives, that the, you can see the contrast, and then he lists the positives. In fact, we'll see that next week too. You're going to see some negatives and you're going to see some positives again. But according to verse 3, uh, and then verse 4 is the negatives, right, that he's going to start listing uh, regarding his motive behind ministry. And so let's face it, our, our motive can be wrong for several different reasons in ministry. And we need to understand that what Paul's talking about here, about having a pure motive behind the ministry that we have, right? Serving the Lord, ministering to the needs of others. Uh, there needs to be a pure motive in doing those things. And let's see, let's see the ne negative aspect. Paul gives us three things in verse 3 re regarding really the motive of the ministry that he had toward them. Number one, there was no deceit. Look at verse 3 again. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. So obviously not in error, not in uncleanness. The word deceit, by the way, it's used ten times in the New Testament. And it means error or fraud or simply to be led astray, right? It's the same word that Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians 2.11. It says, and, and, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now, obviously, the context is something else there, but that word delusion is the same word uh, meaning being led astray or deceived, right? It speaks about deceit. It speaks about uh, being led, like a magician, right? A magician's goal is what? To, to deceive you, to lead you astray in thinking one thing when another thing is actually the, the sleight of hand, right? Just, <coughs> you don't see it happening. So really, that's... That's their goal of the world, I guess you could say. But Paul simply, his point here behind his motive and what he's trying to get to us, behind the ministry was he was not deceitful, right? Paul here, he didn't add to or take away from the Word of God, and I love this, right? Paul hit the tough issues uh, that, that head on, just boom, here it is. He didn't tiptoe around it, right? He, he went straight for it, and he called it the way it was. Whatever was happening, hey, Bam! He's like a general. You guys ever been around people from the military? And they see something and they're just like, "Why don't you?" Do, 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 do. And you're like, "Oh, don't say that around people." <laughs> you know, it's, they they just they don't care. Just that's kind of the attitude that Paul had, and he didn't. So this this is a struggle for a lot of us too. A lot of us don't like to tell people, you know, about their sin. About you know, there's just there's areas that cause division that uh, when you quote the Bible, and, and for me it's tough talking about certain issues in the Bible. But I could care. I know it's tough for me because that's my flesh. But it's the Bible, and that's why it's important that we go verse by verse, word for word, right throughout the Scripture, that we receive the whole counsel of God and not the word of man. But if we're not leading people astray, guess what's happening? You're leading people to the truth. And that's why it's important to give them just the truth and don't give them anything else, right? Keep them, that's how you keep them, you safe and your others safe. So we don't take the word of God and we don't, you know, conform it to who we want the word to be and, you know, grocery shop the truth of God's word uh, according to what we think or what we believe or how we feel because those are the things that change. It, let it be the word of God above who you are. We don't proclaim half-truths as well, right? We don't, we don't, we need to stick to the pure word of God, and that's important. So let's look at the second thing. There was no uncleanness. Notice that word uncleanness. It is, usually it speaks of sexual immorality. And Paul is saying, look guys, when I came to you, my motives were pure. Now, he would say, I didn't try to deceive you or dance around the tough issues, right? Uh, and I'm certainly not here for sexual favors, in other words. There was obviously accusing of Paul for the ministry there in Thessalonica. Maybe there was a lot of women that were coming to maybe the Bible studies or the teaching of the Word of God, and guys that are probably liking these girls are probably looking at them, and they look at this guy, and they're just, you know, they're fixed, and they're, they're listening to the Word, and they're looking, and they're like, oh, you, you guys know how that is? 
before you were married, I should say. <laughs> there's there's maybe a, somebody somebody around you, and another guy's jealous, and and the, what do they do? They accuse you of false things. So maybe there's something like that happening. I don't want to read too much into that, but obviously something's happening here, and there's obviously the accusations going on. Uh, of Paul coming and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to the church in hopes. Uh, they would say of getting a date. That's why he's there and giving us the word of God. And think about it. Paul was an ugly guy in appearance, right? And and that we read about in the the what, what is it called? The Mishnah talks about it. The Bible talks about it, right? Uh, he's beat up. He's full of scars. He's a prison inmate guy. He's you know he's 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 all his eyes were all droopy and messed up. So uh, Paul saying, hey, our motive. Our motive, my motive is right. When I came with the gospel, it was pure. It wasn't with any of this stuff. So they're accusing him, uh, using, using his position to attract women, basically. And this is a serious issue. Some, some get in position to do that exact thing, to attract men, women, or money, or things, or you guys get where I'm going, right? That's the wrong motive. You do not come into ministry... And by the way, right now, by you listening to the Word of God, it's ministry. You're coming and you're being ministered to, thus you're ministering to God. And that's what ministry is. Everything that you do, it needs to be ministering onto the Lord. If you're not using what God's given you to give onto the Lord, then that's not ministry, right? So, very interesting thing. So, uh, Paul's saying, hey, our motives need to be right, our motive needs to be pure in whatever we do. So you can see those accusations here, right, from why he's even saying these things. Uh, number three, there was no guile, right? He didn't come with no guile. Look at verse three again. It says, uh, in error on cleanness, nor was it in deceit, uh, but as we have been approved by God, to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but of God, uh, really, he's the one who tests our hearts. By the way, that word guile, I just mentioned, uh, means to be subtle or crafty. It's, it's a fishing term, right? We go fishing. Uh, this word doulos, or dolos, was used by fishermen. They would basically put the bait on the hook, right? And then they would throw it out into the water in hopes of catching <clears throat> a fish. And so that's where that word comes from. And Paul's saying, look, I'm not trying to bait you with anything or hook you with anything here. I'm, I'm just telling you straightforward what it is. There's not, no catch to it. Paul could care less about, you know, uh, people following after him, a big gathering. He could care less about numbers. All he cared about was giving Jesus, right? Or, or a date. He didn't care less about a date. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can say that. Um, so let's look at the positive aspect of Paul's motive. We went through all the negatives, and all of us are like, oh, man. Um, here's the Paul, Paul's positive motives, I guess you can say. Notice the word but right here. It's in contrast to what he's not doing, right? So deceit, uncleanness, guile, right, that we just talked about, to what he <coughs> is doing according to verse 4. And really there's about two things right here that's mentioned. Look at verse 4 again. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing man, but God who tests the heart. So the first is really the motive of Paul's ministry. It was really approved by God himself. Did you guys catch that? Paul was not approving himself. It was not God. It was God, right, who appointed it. It wasn't him who appointed himself or man uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, it's not about because, you know, he was some good person because he was a handsome guy or anything of his own statue, wonderful, perfect, that speech, any of that. We know it's not true. I say amen to that, by the way, right? Uh, but God uses whoever he wants to use, whether they're wealthy, whether they're weak, whether they're strong, whether they're anybody, right, who wants to be used, God can use anybody. So all of us can be approved by God to be really a messenger of God and presenting the gospel of God. So realize that our approval doesn't come from some kind of certificate, right? It doesn't come from a, a whole bunch of men coming together and saying, you are this position, it is approved by God. Obviously, it will be recognized by man if it's approved by God. So, let's look at the second. It's pleasing to God. Look at verse 4 again at the end. Uh, notice, he, he was there to please God, not man, right? So, why please God? Because God, what does he do? He tests the heart. He knows the heart. He made the heart, right? God judges the heart. We don't know 
the motives of people. We do know their actions, though, right? You can, you can tell by the fruit. And that's why everything we do ought to be pleasing unto the Lord. When, when, when we try to please man, we're always going to fail. So never try to attempt to please. You, never, you can't please everybody, right? Uh, as far as ministry is concerned. Now, we should be pleasing unto others, obviously, right? Um, in the sense that we're not to be rude towards others. But whatever we do, it needs to be pleasing unto God rather than man. And I think we know that. But we need to check our hearts. Make sure what we do is, is being done with the right motive. And, and should I do this? Should I do that? All of us have decisions to make. But the question is, you know, we should be asking is, why am I making this decision? You know, what is it going to make in making this decision? What's the impact going to be like? Is it going to draw attention to yourself? Or is it going to bring glory to God? So each believer is going to stand before the judgment seat of God, or really the Bema seat, right? Each believer, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.13, that each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So when we're tried by fire, uh, it will not be for salvation, but obviously it's going to be speaking about our works here at this moment, but not necessarily about the works itself either, although it is, but more so about the motive of those works that we did. Why did you do that in the first place? I would say it's about the heart. So interesting that when God sees us, and at this time too, the Bible says that his eyes are like what? Fire! Thank you, Mr. Fire. So everything... <laughs> Everything that we did with a horrible motive, it's going to be burnt up, like wood, hay, uh, you know, stubble, uh, it's like chaff, right? It's going to be, it's nothing. So when God sees us, he's going to see the gold, the silver, if you will, right? Those precious stones and all the other, the junk, right? It's, it's gone. It's for nothing. And understand, whatever you do, you need to do it with the right motive. You need to do it before the Lord. If you're ministering in the wrong way, Stop, right? If you're doing something for the Lord because you feel like you have to do it, stop. Or just because it's the right thing to do out of, you know, right ritual, religion, whatever it is, um, I encourage you, stop. It's not worth it. Sit down, be ministered to for a while until you can actually minister back on to the Lord with the right motive and pleasing the Lord. So those uh, by the way, too, a little side note, if you're trying to do things in the church or, you know, with, uh, for the church, as far as the body of believers, we get together, do us all a favor and stop if you're trying on your own, because we can all see it, and if you're just, the, you're a bummer. You're, you're a bummer to be around, because you stink, and you're, it's all the flesh, right? If it's not of the work of the Spirit, it's not beautiful at all. It's just like, you're, you're bumming us out, you know? So... Uh, never do the works on your own. Let it be of the Lord. And obviously there's going to be a reward in the end, right? And Jesus to me, he's my reward. So I don't even know what the reward is out there. So praise the Lord for that though. Look, it's a, let's just end with this. Um, we're not going to go to verse 12. Actually, let's go to verse 5. But the, the manner of Paul's ministry, it was right. We went over the negatives, we went over some of the positives. There's three negatives in verse 5 and 6 regarding the method or manner of this ministry that he has there in the church of Thessalonica, and the first is really, there was, no, there was no flattering in his words. Look at verse 5. It says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words. And this word flattering, by the way, only used here and nowhere else in the New Testament. Interesting. Uh, it's carrying the idea of some, saying something in order to get something, right? Manipulating somebody to bring them around your way of thinking is thus the word flattery. So how... Uh, by flattering them. How do you manipulate them? Flatter them, right? By telling them something that might not be necessarily true or might be necessarily true, uh, but to get them to bring you them around your way of thinking is thus the word flattery. So we all love to hear how wonderful we are, right? right? When people uh, used to come up to me and be like, oh, you're, you're the, you, and they just go, you know, the whole list of, I'm cautious now. I just my mind just says, warning, warning, alert, alert, get out of here, get out. I'm like, oh, thank, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> you know, just give them one of those things, but don't stay there and be like, you're my best buddy in the whole 
world. Can, can I have a hug? I just love you. Oh. And they have a different motive, though. That's why they're flattering you, right? And you'll find out they're like, so I want you to do this for me. Oh. And you're like, no. And all of a sudden, they're like, I hate you. And you're like, wait, but you lied? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what flattering is. It's not, they're, they're trying to get you. So be careful with flattering people. Um, and David even said to you in Psalm 12, 3, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. So very, very interesting. So notice in verse 5, 2, it says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor as a cloak for covetousness. By the way, that word cloak speaks of a way of hiding. Covetousness, obviously, like greed. Um, and, and the manner in which we... He was ministering, um, was not for these things. He didn't have any of these. Um, look at verse 6, and let's just end with 6. We're not going to go further. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So uh, Paul didn't desire glory from men. Although he was entitled to honor, and I just looked this up this morning too, I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but I was in a rush. But turn with me to 1 Timothy, and you don't need to turn back because we'll just end here. But 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 17. Paul had that position, and he could have rightfully asked for it as far as giving him honor, right? Instead of, he gives all that glory to God, but he did have that position in, in the sense 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 17. It says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Obviously, you can't let somebody come work in your house all day Right? And then you're like, okay, see you later, brother. <laughs> That's why you serve me, because you're a brother. Don't forget that. You do it unto the Lord, and I just gained a whole bunch from you. You know, so obviously the real world, it doesn't work like that. And, and the same thing scripturally, Paul's saying, hey, give double honor to the elders. Right? Paul was worthy of that honor from them, but he said no. Right? I, I, I'm not going to receive it. I'm giving glory to the Lord. In fact, he labored uh, with his own hands. And we can, we can finish the rest of this study on, up later, too. Uh, but just wanted to end with, with that. So let's go ahead and pray. And then uh, if you guys have any questions as well. Father, thank you so much uh, for just giving us this time to just look at the life of Paul, the purpose, ministry of Paul there in the church of Thessalonica. And obviously, uh, there's accusations coming his way, and he is showing, proving uh, giving the example of how his life was, how his heart was, what his mind was like uh, there in the midst of ministry, in the times of trouble, in the times uh, when people come against us. And I pray, uh, Lord, that we would be encouraged, Lord, uh, to do uh, the things that we do onto you with a pure heart, Lord, that we would have no other motive uh, for coming together as the body of Christ, Lord, but to please you, to glorify you, to give you our hearts, Lord. Your word says to buy the truth and, and don't sell it. Go give it freely. And so help us, Lord, to, to invest in your word and go out there and proclaim your word, Lord, and that others uh, would be saved and we would see uh, just a tremendous impact, Lord, in your uh, the moving of your spirit through our lives. Maybe not now, uh, but when we're with you, there, the, the, your kingdom, Lord, uh, that would be awesome, Lord, just to see the impact you did through our lives, and yet we didn't see a thing of it. <laughs> mm. And now, because of our hearts, Lord. So we just, we love you, Father. Thank you uh, for what you're doing here in this fellowship. And we pray you would continue uh, what you're doing as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.